Attention. Do you or a loved one suffer from early onset pessimism? Do you feel a sense of dread in the face of humanity's countless challenges, only to quiver at your total insignificance in the grand scheme of the cosmos? Well, then you just might qualify for a little Star Wars. Yeah, that sounds weird, but we're not talking about the movies. All right, I'm talking about the bigger, better, real-life version of that story happening right here, right now, on our little pale blue dot. All right, got all the same pieces as Star Wars 2, an Empire, Rebels, Obi-Wan. I right, even have a Luke Skywalker. That's us. All right, you, me, civilization at large, we are the heroes of this story. Because you see, where there are people, thinking, creative people like us, with expectations about how we want the world to be, there are always going to be problems, right? Ways in which the world does not align with our preferences, problems that may even threaten our survival. But guess what? People can solve problems by using the force of knowledge. That's right. Humanity's hero story depends on our ability to consistently create new knowledge. Right, and to understand that, we gotta get the full backstory. All right, you see, since the beginning of time, there have always been Jedi. Scientists, philosophers, individuals who use the force of knowledge to address the most pressing problems of the day. All right, in fact, back in ancient Greece, we basically had our first Jedi order. It was a society based around the free exchange of ideas with it, we got democracy, cartography, all of these advances. But unfortunately, the fun didn't last long because the Athenians didn't solve enough problems in time. Right? War overran their country. Disease spread through their population. They didn't know how to balance the force. But we do. Okay, because we have a Yoda, philosopher Karl Popper, who's got the ears to match. All right? No one knew the force better than Sir Karl. And to show this, we need some real-world metaphors. Because the last thing we want to suggest is that knowledge is magical. It's not. It's very real. Okay, so remember, we got people, we got problems. But people can solve problems, and we do it all the time. To the point, we don't even think about certain types of problems anymore. Right? Take shelter as an example. A constant problem tens of thousands of years ago is now an afterthought to most of us. Right? But the catch is, no matter the problem we solve, we always get a new set of problems. You know, our wonderful air-conditioned shelters, they're one of the reasons we hear a lot about climate change now. Because it's a fundamental fact of our universe that problems are inevitable. Right? The world could not exist without them. But just as fundamental of a fact is problems are also soluble, and we solve them by creating new knowledge. Right? Just like the dark side, our problems are never fully vanquished. Right? They get replaced by bigger, better versions. So our goal as the hero is to keep them in balance. Right? Because the outcomes for society are that simple. Right? Either we conquer our problems or they conquer us. Because when we jump back into the plot, we remember that after ancient Greece, this is more or less what happened for a thousand years. Right, we couldn't conquer our problems. Right, we called it the Dark Ages for a reason. Scientists barely made any substantial discoveries. Basically, century after century, it was attack of the clone societies. Right, no new cosmology. We were up against disease, death, dogma. Right, and that's not to dismiss a whole era. Certain individuals made some gains, but just when you'd get a little progress, things would fall right back. And to understand why, we have to bring back Popper and ask how does the force of knowledge actually work? You see, no matter the problem, any solution starts as a guess in a single person's mind, right? All creative knowledge begins this way. Take heliocentrism. Copernicus made a bold guess that the earth was actually in orbit of the sun. And like so many bold guesses before him, he brought us closer to truth. He did what all people do when faced with a problem. We create a theory to explain what's going on we conjecture how we might actually solve it. One of my favorite examples is the history of electricity, right? our theories of which they evolved over 2,000 years. Right? The problem started as a modest one. People like Thales in ancient Greece, they noticed sparks flying off amber 
when they rubbed fur over it. Right? They were witnessing static electricity, wondering how is this possible? What causes this? And Thales, he thought Amber had a soul of sorts, which wasn't a very good guess. Right? But it's not like the guesses got better from there. It wasn't really until Ben Franklin connects natural phenomenon like lightning to electricity. Right? He thought it was a fluid of sorts, slightly better guess. Right? Then you get Ampere, who links magnetism and electricity. Then Michael Faraday comes along, and his even better guesses, they lay the groundwork for an actual electrical engine. And James Maxwell, he formalizes all these theories into descriptive equations, into field theory, foundational physics. Right? We go from how does amber create sparks to today, we ask how can we generate enough of this stuff to power 10 billion devices? And it's only because of the testament to the countless problems we solved along the way. Because it doesn't matter what subject we're dealing with, this is always how progress occurs. We point to the problem at hand, we make a guess at a solution, then we let others inspect our conjecture. That's the other half of knowledge creation. We criticize each other's guesses. We put them through the ringer, right? Try to find mistakes in their reasoning, their logic, their consistency. And the ones that survive, we test, right? We build real world models and see if the theory can withstand the various pressures of reality. Right? And when we do this successfully, we don't win. Science never wins. We get something called a good explanation, right? which occurs when our guesses have enough explanatory power to push past the difficulties of our problems. Right? We might prefer calling them breakthroughs to remind us that a good explanation is not easy to come by. We have to remember all our guesses before a good one have failed. Right? Picture Luke outside the Death Star, watching the whole Allied fleet not even make a dent. It took a perfect strike of the force to get to the core of the problem. And that's how it is in the real world. Every problem has a design flaw, so to speak, that can only be exploited by hard to vary explanations. By a series of bold guesses and ruthless criticisms, that's how we create explanatory knowledge. All right, this is the way of the force which Popper described. You start with a problem, you propose a tentative theory, you criticize that theory, you error correct it until it's just so until you have a good explanation, then you stand atop your perch and take in the brand new set of problems awaiting you. On the battlefield of progress, these are the weapons we wield, conjecture and criticism. And remind you how far we've come, we got a last time. Jump back in the action, okay? Remember, we left off at the dark ages, not pretty. Right back then, there wasn't even enough progress to be pessimistic about. Our best thinkers, they weren't just ignored, they were persecuted. Right? Galileo, for example, he died under house arrest for trying to get us closer to truth. Right? It wasn't until the Enlightenment, the 16, 1700s, that we see the Force awaken. Civilization gets a new hope. Right? The Jedi, backed by a rebel spirit, they fight back against the oppressive authorities that held them down. Right? And truly, for almost 300 years, we balanced the Force. In the Western world, we built a tradition of criticism a scientific community that made wholesale progress, that rapidly solved problems in cosmology, biology, medicine. But then in the 20th century, with the rise of fascism, communism, the dropping of the bomb, we, we see a retreat from the force. All right, the empire strikes back, so to speak, because even though we're still rapidly solving problems, we start to hear about how technology is the enemy, how we're too powerful for our own good, how, how our hubris our hubris will be our demise. Right? And of course, it's always when the hero feels most uneasy, least in control, that they get wisdom from a guide, an elder, an Obi-Wan. And wouldn't you know, an Obi-Wan walks amongst us in the form of physicist David Deutsch. Right? You see, like Obi-Wan, David was and is a formidable Jedi, a scientist who worked at the front lines of our biggest problems. He founded quantum computation, advanced the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics, He's a disciple of our Yoda, Karl Popper. And these days, his most prominent role is to remind civilization of the journey that remains ahead, to remind people of the power of the force. Because as David so brilliantly explains, humans, we are universal explainers, which means anything and everything that can be understood about the universe can be understood by us. We have that ability. The only obstacle to solving any problem we want to understand is whether or not the laws of physics say something is or isn't possible. 
Right, what do we mean by that? If you'll notice, every diagram has been resting on something. Right, resting on the basic laws of nature. Where we take them for granted, space, time, gravity, these are all predetermined by the laws of physics. They represent our cosmological backdrop, which every world, fictional or real, needs. Even Star Wars. Right? Jedis can't just teleport whenever they want. They're still constrained by fictional laws of nature, some of which we happen to share. Because in our world, in reality, if you, if you guess a solution that involves, say, traveling faster than the speed of light, that guess either violates the laws of physics right, and should be dismissed for many reasons as a bad explanation. Or you found a newer, deeper law of physics and it's time to pop the champagne. Right? Because when it comes to our deepest laws of physics, no one knows them better than David. And he proposes four strands that make up the fabric of reality. Four fundamental theories that really can't be understood without invoking the others. And the first of which we've already talked about at length, Popperian epistemology, which says science is about understanding the world through good explanations, not predicting it from repeated observations. The next strand is biological evolution, right, which is ultimately another form of knowledge creation. Right, whereas explanatory knowledge, we, we generate that with creative guesses. Genes and their mutations are random. Right, you can think of a species almost as a blind guess at solving the problem of their environment. Right, if the genes don't fit the niche, they fail. And the third strand is computation, which because of the work of Alan Turing, we know is a universal language that can express anything. Everything that is an algorithm can be run on a Turing machine, on a computer. And it turns out everything in nature is in some way an algorithm. Even our thoughts, right? Our most creative thoughts, they are a product of software running on our minds. And it's that special relationship to computation that gives us the ability to explain anything in the world. And finally, we have quantum mechanics, perhaps our deepest physical theory. Right, you can see the famous double slit experiment here that tells the story of entanglements, meaningful entanglements of matter and information that underpin our entire universe, or I should say our multiverse, right? Because when you take these theories together, you get this incredible picture of the world, of parallel universes, ever evolving knowledge. We come to understand the laws of nature as this wonderful woven web of guesses. And until a new problem forces us to unify them even more deeply, we use David's strands as the best approximation, as criteria for what is possible and impossible in our universe. Because that's all we truly need to make one incredible claim. You see, something is either ruled out by the laws of nature, there's a fact about the universe we cannot change, or it is achievable with the right knowledge. All right, this is what David calls his momentous dichotomy. And it's aimed at people who think we can't overcome our problems, that we're doomed for reasons outside our control, right? It really is that simple. There's only two options. Either something is forbidden by the laws of nature or the problem can be solved with better guesses, with explanatory knowledge. That's, that's it, right? And all we need to form such knowledge is conjecture and criticism. And as David so keenly points out, anything that can be explained with such knowledge can also be controlled. Okay, our ability to solve problems knows no limits. Okay, the reach of our power is infinite. So to all of you out there who feel stuck, right, stuck thinking that people are meaningless cosmic dust, I say, Luke, it is your destiny. Right, there are no problems too big. We can solve aging, intergalactic travel, even artificial general intelligence. If we discover the program for creativity, we can create other minds, which would be like if R2-D2 could use the force, right? And we have to remember, this is not to say nothing is guaranteed. We can fail at any point. Our problems can always conquer us. And God knows we're staring down some massive ones too, climate change, disinformation, inequality. Okay, so defining problems, agreeing on their severity becomes critical, right? We have to frame the problem correctly, ask the right questions. Like Admiral Akbar, we need to be strategic about which problems represent the biggest threat and why. All the while remembering, even Jedi are fallible. Okay, our best minds can become complacent. Their quest for certainty can turn an Anakin into a Vader. But when it comes to bad actors in our universe, we can make a very profound claim. 
You see, in the face of our infinite problems, there is only one true evil, and that is to suppress the growth of knowledge, to prohibit creativity, to ban persuasion, right? We have to always keep guessing in order to keep the dark side in balance. And anyone forcing people to stop solving problems is either, either ignorant or a Palpatine, right? And a Palpatine can be criticized and dealt with as exactly that. This is David's principle of optimism. It says our moral failings can only stem from a lack of, lack of knowledge, but that can always be fixed. No matter how dire the situation, we can always persuade someone to adopt a better explanation. It takes a belief in progress, along with an open society based on tolerance, optimism, a willingness to change, that, that ultimately understands every big problem solved is worthy of celebration. Okay, but we're merely at the beginning of infinity. Our hero's story is infinitely untold. Right? And it doesn't matter if it's Luke or Ray, the task of humanity is to be a Skywalker, to rise again and again, time after time. And so to all those suffering from early onset pessimism, I say to you one thing. Use the force, Luke. Use the goddamn force.